Well, greetings and welcome to this uh, first chapel being delivered to you remotely as a result of our semester being suspended here at Cairn University due to the COVID-19 virus crisis. I'm really happy with our decision to provide for you twice a week these cyber chapels, for lack of a better term. And I'm excited about the opportunity to open the word each Monday. And we've invited friends and faculty from the university to provide a second chapel talk later in the week. It's my hope and prayer that these would be a source of spiritual encouragement to you and that they would also help you to feel connected still to the Cairn University family. Despite the fact that we're not able to gather uh, in the Chatlow's Chapel, we can uh, join together in hearing these chapel talks and to continuing to receive nourishment from God's Word and to join together in prayer for the needs around us and for the university and for one another. I'm hopeful that you as traditional undergraduates will take full advantage of these things. And even though you don't have to scan your cards and take a seat in Chatlos, <clears throat> that you will continue to participate in these cyber chapels. But I'm also hoping that our uh, circle of encouragement would expand. And if you're a non-traditional student, an online student, <clears throat> a graduate student, maybe you're a friend and supporter of the university or an alum, I hope that you'll join us for these chapel talks as well each week and that you'll find some encouragement from them as well. And I would encourage all of you to go back and listen to previous chapels on our podcast or check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we want to be a blessing and encouragement to the body of Christ in these days. We always want to be that, but uh, in these times when we're feeling maybe a more acute sense of anxiety and concern, uh, we feel it's necessary to provide that kind of regular encouragement, and I pray that it'll be just that. You know, in times like these, we need our faith strengthened, and the Bible's very clear that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So let me encourage you uh, to stay in the Word, uh, to avail yourself of all of the great preaching that's out there um, and available to us uh, in the various forms of media that we have at our disposal. There are great opportunities for us to stay in the Word, uh, to keep growing in our faith and in the knowledge and grace of God. And my hope is that uh, these opportunities for us at Cairn University will, uh, will do that as well. You know, I went back and forth about what to do, uh, whether or not I should uh, choose some topics and passages of scripture directly related to the crisis or continue my series <clears throat> that I began in January. And with the input from some students and from some friends, I've decided to stay the course and to uh, keep on with this series we began in January entitled The One We Follow, Jesus Through the Eyes of His Disciples. You know, we began that series because I uh, think that it's important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to know the one we follow. It's not enough to know about Jesus. It's not enough to know facts about him or uh, to know where we can find the stories about him. We need to know him, to know who he is, his nature and character, his attributes, his power, his works. Um, and there's no better way to do that than to look at him through the eyes of his disciples, through the eyes of his students. Those men that he called to himself, that walked with him, that witnessed firsthand his miracles, that heard his interaction with uh, those in need, that heard his interaction with the Pharisees and others who opposed him. Uh, and so what we've been doing all semester is looking at Jesus through the lens of his disciples. And we started by looking at what it must have been like for them to receive the call from Jesus, to drop everything, their nets, their jobs, leave their families and follow him. And the importance of that for you and I, to follow Jesus no matter what. We looked at Jesus' feeding of the multitudes, his compassion and care, his concern for them, and the power that he has to meet the needs of those that he sees. And what that must have been like for the disciples to witness that kind of compassion and that kind of power. And then most recently, we looked at Jesus in the boat and his calming of the storm. When the disciples find themselves in a perilous situation where they think they're going to die, they turn around and there in the back of the boat is Jesus sleeping. And so they wake him and Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why are you afraid? Today, what I'd like to do is open a passage of scripture that I've been thinking about as well in light of the context in which we find ourselves. It's a familiar passage. It's one that I'm very fond of. It's found in John chapter 10. 
And so I'd like to read it, <clears throat> beginning at verse 10. Again, a familiar passage. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray, and then I'd like to make a few observations about this text. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and grace to us, and we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to the teaching of your word this morning, that we might think anew about what it means to follow Jesus, who is the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep and takes it up again. Father, we pray as we think on this passage, we might uh, learn through the eyes of the disciples of Jesus what it meant to follow this one, your all-powerful Son, who is our Savior and our Lord, we pray in his name. Amen. You know, uh, I've thought about this passage quite a bit uh, over the course of my life, and I've read through the book of John more times than I can count, and this passage <clears throat> in chapter 10 has always struck me. There are a few things in it that I find particularly compelling. One, I love the authority of Jesus when he says, uh, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have the authority to lay it down. No one takes it from me. I lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. It is his death, burial, and resurrection that secures for us redemption and forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. And that's what we believe. We believe in Jesus, the Savior, who was given up as a sacrifice, who went to the slaughter like a lamb, whose blood atones for our sin, and our faith in his death, burial, and resurrection secures for us those things. And that's a really powerful part that comes uh, leaping off the pages in this passage. I also particularly like the image of Jesus as a good shepherd, the uh, sort of agrarian images that that conjures up of sheep in the field and having a shepherd who provides for them and protects them, who drives off the wolves and the lions and tigers and bears, the one who leads them to green pastures and leads them beside still waters. That imagery from the 23rd Psalm is tied to this passage in John. But there's something very interesting in this passage that would have been directly related to the disciples' experience. This is not teaching on the road as Jesus is walking by a meadow full of sheep. This is not Jesus sort of watching a shepherd lead his flock across a dusty path into a green pasture where Jesus stops and offers this teaching. The disciples are witnessing an interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees who are criticizing him for his healing of a man born blind on the Sabbath. What is unfolding in this section of scripture is really powerful. And I can't imagine what the disciples were thinking when they were watching it through their own eyes. Jesus had encountered a man who was born blind. The disciples had asked him, this man is born blind and for what reason? And Jesus heals this man. And then there, through a series of, of interactions in the preceding chapter, we see that the Pharisees are deeply disturbed by Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And so they go after this man, they go after his parents, they interrogate him, they haul him back and forth, they haul his parents in, they drive his parents out, they haul him back in, they bring him out. And Jesus sees that this man is being uh, uh, persecuted and tormented for his being healed at the hands of Jesus and goes to the man and they have this wonderful interaction where the man professes faith in Jesus and goes on his way, knowing that the Son of God has made him whole 
and has saved him. And he professes faith in Jesus Christ. And then the Pharisees come after Jesus. And that's the context in which Jesus begins to talk about himself as a good shepherd. He doesn't engage them on the level of the law to say uh, whether or not he's justified in healing on the Sabbath. He says, I am the good shepherd. This sheep, this sheep was in need and I am the good shepherd and I can care for him and meet his need. You don't understand who you're talking to. And so Jesus says he's talking about himself as the good shepherd and the disciples watching this interaction with the spiritual leaders, the so-called shepherds of the Jewish people, who seemingly would have preferred that this man remain blind rather than be healed, question Jesus' act of compassion and grace, question his power and authority. And Jesus simply turns and says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And my sheep know me and I know them. And I lay my life down for them and I take it up again. This is what the fathers sent me to do. This is the charge that the Father gave me, and I will carry it out as the Good Shepherd, because I didn't come to steal or to kill or destroy as the thief does. I came to give life and to give it abundantly. The disciples would have watched this unfold on a number of levels. One, what that must have meant in the context it would have provided to Jesus meeting the needs of this man born blind and changing his life forever, such that that man comes to faith in Jesus as his Messiah. But he also, they also would have seen it through the eyes of looking at Jesus' confronting of these religious leaders. And, and the idea inherent in this passage is, you are bad shepherds. I am a good shepherd. I do not run when the wolf threatens. I don't run in the opposite direction. In fact, what I do is run to the rescue. While the Pharisees were not those kinds of shepherds, they were but hired hands. And then it also would have been true that the disciples would have been thinking what this means for them, that Jesus is that good shepherd who, who provides for his followers all that they need. David knew this about the Lord quite well because he expresses it so eloquently in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is his shepherd, and as a result of that, he lacks nothing. He needs nothing because the Lord is his shepherd. The Lord who provides for him green pastures and still waters and protection in the valley of the shadow of death, the one who drives off the threats, the one who sets before him a table before his enemies. His cup overflows, and goodness and mercy will follow him all the days of his life. Why? Because the Lord Jesus is the good shepherd. You and I in this day are the sheep of his flock, and Jesus is a good shepherd who's come to give us life and life abundantly. Even in the midst of our anxieties and fears and concerns, even in the midst of great uncertainty, even in the midst of threat of real life, Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd always. He's the good shepherd in rain and in shine. He's the good shepherd in light and in dark. He is the good shepherd when the wolf comes prowling. He is the good shepherd in the calm setting of green pastures and still waters. Jesus is the good shepherd. The one we follow knows what we need and meets our needs according to his good and perfect will. His rod and staff bring us comfort. His goodness and mercy shall be with us all the days of our life. And he has come to give us life and life abundant. In that is great encouragement. And I hope that, uh, you will read this passage in John and think about what it must have been like for the disciples to hear this teaching in this context. Jesus has healed a man born blind and he's being criticized for it. And Jesus turns and says, all I've done is what good shepherds do. Be encouraged this day that uh, Jesus is our good shepherd. And be encouraged this day that God knows what it is that keeps us awake at night. He cares and loves us and his loving kindness is enduring and faithful. His mercies are new every morning. God bless and have a great day.